Welcome to the Dark Side of the Library podcast, where we let you know about upcoming awesome dark books, and we haven't read any of them yet ourselves because they're so brand new, they're not even out yet. This is the episode on dark non-fiction books. I'm your creepy co-host, Carrie, or host, Carrie, and I'm here with my co-host, Katie, and I apparently need a little bit more caffeine this morning. Yay! Caffeine! <laughs> I'll start us off today with Thank our you. first nonfiction book. It is called Accidental, Rebuilding a Life After Taking One. Oof, we're starting off really deep today. Ooh. Yeah, this is by David W. Peters. It comes out November 7th. So the question is, how do we rebuild after causing accidental death or injury? It's the leading cause of death for Americans under the age of 45. So obviously traffic accidents, um, firearms injuries, ca casualties of war, and deadly viruses like that pass on to elderly loved ones. Those are all like accidental deaths that were contributing to this book. Accidental harm dates back almost as far as our human stories go. So when these accidents occur, they pose profound and agonizing questions. What do we do when a death falls somewhere between a murder and an insurance claim? What if we are responsible for such harm? Is healing ah. even possible? Ugh, God. I think about that stuff a lot, actually. I'm not going to lie. Especially when COVID was around. I was like, oh, my God, what happens if, you know, I pass something on to somebody and oh, it yeah. does cause them harm? So this whole book is rooted in research on moral injury religious rituals of confession and cleansing, and psychology, as well as the hard-won wisdom of somebody who has actually been there. Ugh. Accidental explores the complicated reality of accidental death and injury and offers companionship to those affected by these tragedies. Author, military veteran, and priest David W. Peters walks with us through his own lonely journey after he unintentionally killed someone in a traffic accident and the journey of his family as his brother was killed by a bus. Oh my god, that's horrible for This is a great members. way to start off the morning. Thank you, Katie. I know, right? Hopefully you're <laughs> listening to this midday. <laughs> Oh, God. So they investigate cars, guns, and obviously the system that puts some people in communities, in communities at more risk than others. So this is a really heavy book, but I think it is an important one. And I think if you have had an experience like this, it might be kind of comforting to, you know, find a, a person or a story that might you might relate to because I can only imagine how difficult it is. I feel blessed I haven't had that happen to me. Yes. So I hope, yes, everybody is well. But if you are interested in reading this book, I do think it's kind of important. This is called Accidental by David W. Peters. My first book today is called Afterlives of Endor. Witchcraft, Theatricality, and Uncertainty from the Malleus Maleficarum to Shakespeare. It's by Laura Levine. It is definitely a scholarly book. It's from Cornell University Press. Comes out November 15. In hardcover, it's $125, so this is not going to be of general interest. But it offers an analysis of the way early modern English literature addressed the period's anxieties about witchcraft and theatricality. What determined whether or not a demonologist imagined a trial as a spectacle? What underlying epistemological constraints govern such choices, and what conceptions of witchcraft did these choices reveal? Mm. The author is going to pair readings of de demonological texts with canonical plays and poetry. She's going to examine such questions. They're going to analyze manuals and pamphlets about the prosecution of witches, including Reginald Scott's The Discovery of Witchcraft from 1584, a whole bunch of books in demonology, and then examining the way that literary texts such as Shakespeare's The Winter Tale and also The Tempest, Spencer's The Fairy Queen, and Marlowe's Tragical History of Dr. Faustus are addressing anxieties about witchcraft, illusion, and theatricality. That is a too heavy of a book for me. I don't have the reading comprehension to understand it, but I wanted to let you goth scholars and goth acu I can't even say academians <laughs> know about it. It's Afterlives of Endor by Laura Levine. 
Man, we're we're starting really strong on this. Not this is a very nonfiction episode because <laughs> my next book is Anatomical Oddities, the otherworldly realms hidden within our bodies. This is Ooh. by Alice Roberts, who is a science writer and illustrator. This came out November seventh. The this is a visual and linguistic adventure through our strange and astonishing world that is anatomy. So did you know that you have cobwebs in your head, hair uh, in your lungs, and snails in your ears? I know about the cobwebs part because you can tell by listening to this podcast that I have that issue. Ah, right. Uh, so in the world of anatomy, every name paints a picture. So the cobwebs in your head is the arachnoid matter, a brain membrane that resembles a spider web. We have here, okay, so this is the ciliated epithelium, which is in your respiratory tract that looks like an eyelash, so that's why we have hair in our lungs. So this is a quirky and very bizarre and beautiful uh, book that traverses the body's crypts, islets, mountains to reveal a secret map of organ tissue bone, complete with peculiar place names such as the duodenum, the duodenum, which is Greek for 12 fingers long part of the gut. <laughs> what a name. Uh, there are overlooked but essential regions of our bodies that they go over. It features stunning original artwork by Alice Roberts. And there are 57 brief lessons in anatomy that lay bare the intricate details of the human body, the history of those who unearthed its secrets, and the rich world of language that gives us form. It is always a very interesting thing to explore the people who did unravel the secrets inside of the human body, especially weird bits in your respiratory system that look like eyelashes. So... This book is called Anatomical Oddities. It is really cool. I think I'll probably pick this up. It is by Alice Roberts. My next book is The Art of Ectoplasm. What? Encounters with Winnipeg's Ghost Photographs. It's by Serena Kishavji. It comes out November 1st from University of Manitoba Press. So it's the legacy of the Hamilton Psychic Archive. Right after the First World War and the 1918-19 to pandemic, the world was left grappling with a profound sense of loss. It was against this backdrop that a Winnipeg couple, Dr. T.G. Hamilton and nurse Lillian Hamilton, began their research documenting and photographing seances that they held in their home laboratory. They made an extensive study of the survival of human consciousness after death, and it resulted in a stunning collection of hundreds of photographs, including images of tables flying through the air, mediums in trances, and most curious of all, ectoplasm, a strange white substance through which ghosts could apparently manifest. So this book invites readers to explore the Hamilton's research and photographic evidence. This is super fascinating to me. I'm definitely going to pick it up. It is The Art of Ectoplasm by Serena Kishavji. That sounds very interesting. My next book is Bat Island. It is a rare journey into the hidden world of tropical bats. This comes out November 21st. There's a ton of amazing authors in here and beautiful photography. Um, and a lot of these uh, people have contributed to like National Geographic and the Smithsonian Tropical Research Institute. This is a cool coffee table book. It features... 76 species of bats that are on Panama's Barrow, Colorado Island. It is very cool. There's over 100, 150 photographs. There are article, not articles, but different excerpts written by Smithsonian scientists, and they talk about their cutting-edge research. But when you look over on to the Amazon page here in our show notes, you will see some cute sample pictures here. There's literally one of a bat that is, I think, hiding in a leaf and just screaming, but it's so chonky and cute. I love him. <laughs> and there's a, a bat here that looks like it, it it's like, um, I guess, kind of like a hummingbird, but his tongue is sticking out because it's like he's uh, like a pollinator trying to 
attach himself to a little flower, but or it's is he really just cute. thirsty? He might be. It's he's got a, like a really long tongue, but it's just kind of goofy and cute. They're they're dogs with wings. So if you are interested in learning about different bats, like these are very rare sites too. It's not just the everyday bat. If you want to learn more about the science and their world. And with photos alongside, this is a very cool book to have. It is 160 pages. This is called Bat Island. This is by Dr. Rachel Page, Dinah Deckman, Dr. M. Teague O'Mara, and so many people. My next book is Conjuring the Calabash, Empowering Women with Hoodoo Spells and Magic. I am down for that. It's by Llewellyn Publications, and the author is Mawia Kai Aljama Bomani. It comes out November 8. It's about black girl magic, queer girl magic, straight girl magic, trans magic, bisexual magic. It's authentic and unapologetic, a guide to magical spirituality that empowers you to take back the power to heal and shine under your own strength. It's written by an accomplished hoodoo practitioner. Conjuring the Calabash features spells, recipes, and rituals that help you rise out of the constrictions around you. You're going to learn how to bless your calabash, which is your sacred womb, with love and reawaken your fullest potential through folk traditions, personal stories, and her favorite songs and pop stars. Hmm. That's Conjuring the Calabash by Mawia Kai El Jama Bomani. I hope I pronounced that correctly. Beautiful. My next book got pushed to December, so something you might have to wait for. <laughs> this is the Curepedia. An A to Z. I know. (laughs) I'm like... (laughs) Christmas hint. Sorry. This is an A to Z of The Cure. This comes out December 12th now. This is by Simon Price. This is a complete and truly unique biography of Robert Smith and a company, The Cure. It chronicles their 40 plus year history with hundreds of entries in A to Z fashion. So the Cure remain 40 plus years into their career, one of the biggest rock bands in the world. They have 12 studio albums, tours that pack stadiums all over the world, um, including their most recent spring-summer 2023 tour in North America. Like, that was still packed with kids who were like 20 (laughs) You know, Yay, goth lives on. It's pretty amazing. So they were and the first. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. I'm just sad that I wasn't able to go to their concerts. Ah, I was so busy. It's horrible. I know. And honestly, this book should have been Carrie's book. I feel kind of horrible that I'm talking about it because you would give it way more. I almost went in and edited our script. <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> So they were the first alternative band to be inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. I actually did not know that. Um, And that was in 2019 by Trent Reznor. That's crazy that that took so long. I know. So their influence is heard in bands as wide ranging as Twilight Sad to Interpol to My Chemical Romance. I mean, for real, it's true. So amidst the record setting shows of a Lost World tour winding down, acclaimed music journalist Simon Price slash our author has crafted a first of its kind history of this band that will satisfy Legion that will satisfy Legion of fans eagerly waiting the Cure's new album. Oh, they've got something coming out? Oh my god. So Curepedia Curepedia is a career spanning and in-depth biography of the Cure. So if you are interested in this, this is totally necessary. It is worth the price. It's only $35, 448 pages long. It has a two color format with photos and all. I mean, it's got a lot of cool stuff in here. Entries from the band, um, just beautifully packaged book generally. This is a great Christmas gift. Hint. (laughs) I know. Uh, So this is Curepedia. This is by Simon Price. My next book is about David Bowie, Mixing Memory and Desire. It's by Kevin Cummins. The publisher is Mitchell Beasley. It comes out November 14. It starts at the legendary Bowie gigs in the er early 1970s. 
through a poignant image taken outside his apartment in New York in 2016. Kevin Cummins has captured the many faces of Bowie, including previously unpublished material, and created a book that's essential for Bowie fans everywhere. And a lot of goths love David Bowie, even though he personally wasn't a goth and his music wasn't dark. It was just beautiful. So yes. we included it here. Kevin Cummings in 1973 was a 19 year old photography student and photographed David Bowie. And that started his career as a celebrated pop photographer. Holy cow. Wow. Wow. And that image is now in the renowned photography collection of the V&A Museum. Oh my god. So, there's some that's why there's so many behind the scenes photographs cuz he had unprecedented access to David Bowie from that moment on. So, it's going to be a gorgeous coffee table book and be sure to check out the affiliate links in our show notes if you want to shop for this book on Amazon. We get a small commission. And if not, that's totally okay too. We're here to entertain you. That is David Bowie, Mixing Memory and Desire by Kevin Cummins. And my book is a not-so-beautiful coffee table book. It is The Devil Inside, The Dark Legacy of the Exorcist. You get a nice face of her creepy makeup right there on the cover. And for some reason, I have both of The Exorcist books today, so... Something's Yay. telling me something. Uh, so this comes out November 14th. This is by Carlos Acevedo. Acevedo. So in 1973, The Exorcist is notorious. I mean, people left the movies screaming, gripping their rosary beads. Uh, people were <laughs> vomiting in their popcorn buckets. They were <laughs> fainting in the aisles. I mean, this was a big deal That's in the 70s. Drama. Yeah. Absolutely. It was also marketed as a, quote, true story, and it became one of the most controversial films ever released. With its groundbreaking special effects, relentless pace, and terrifying finale, the film revolutionized the horror genre and paved the way for future blockbusters. It totally did. Um, so in this book, our author goes beyond the myths to examine the national uproar the exorcist caused, as well as the dark real-world effects it had on a jittery audience. Until now, books about the exorcist have largely per perpetrated or perpetuated its legends while overlooking its cultural background. So in this book, it places the film in its cinematic and social context, as a product of the, quote, new Hollywood, when Maverick directors hijacked the film industry and as part of the supernatural trends of the times where the occult permeated music, books, and movies. So from the original possession case that inspired the novel to the production of the film, to the conflicts on the set, to the uptick in the demands for actual exorcisms, this book sheds new light on a new or on a shocking phenomena ha that has remained in pop culture for like 50 years now. So this is kind of cool. I literally just watched a documentary over the weekend about a an exorcist case from the Ooh. 70s, 80s. So it was kind of interesting to talk about that. So this is The Devil Inside. This is by Carlos Acevedo. My next book is Diseased Cinema, Plagues, Pandemics, and Zombies in American Movies. Oh. It is by Robert Alpert, Merle Eisenberg, and Lee Mordecai. It is from Edinburgh University Press. It's another $100 hardcover reference book for serious scholars, etc. I really hope it covers my favorite zombie movie, 28 Days Later, which I am due for a rewatch of because I forgot to watch it during the spooky season in October. Yeah. So this book covers American movies about infectious diseases because they have reflected and driven dominant cultural narratives during the past century. These movies, both real pandemics and imagined zombie outbreaks, have become wildly popular, yes, but they've shifted from featuring a contained outbreak to an imagined containment of a known disease to a globalized, uncontainable pandemic of an unknown origin. Movie narratives have changed from identifying and solving social problems to a despair and acceptance of America's failure to fulfill its historic social contract. Oh, don't get me started. Mm -hmm. So movies reflect and drive developments in American capitalism that increasingly advocates for individuals and their families 
rather than communities and the public good. Disease movies today minimize human differences and envisage a utopian new world order to advance the needs of contemporary American capitalism. These movie narratives shaped reactions to the outbreak of COVID and reinforced individual responsibility as the solution to end the pandemic. And I unfortunately do not have a preview or a table of contents. I probably should have looked up on Edelweiss to see. But this is a very interesting reference book, Disease Cinema, Plagues, Pandemics, and Zombies in American Movies by Robert Alpert and others from Edinburgh University Press. Oh, that's a, that's a big book. Yes. My next book is Diablo, Heradric Vault. It's the complete collection. So we have the Book of Cain, Book of Tyriel, Book of Adria, and Book of Lorath. Matt Burns has been a huge contributor. He's one of the authors uh, to the Diablo 4 franchise. We also have Robert Brooks. Matthew J. Kirby has contributed to a lot of Diablo novels and books over the course of many years. So this whole set of books is 632 pages. This is the perfect gift for any of your loved ones who are Diablo fans. Diablo 4 did come out this year. It's very still, I mean, like people still love the franchise. I do too. I do too. So this uh, whole thing is basically a box set that has a lot of beautiful illustrations that include uh, deep diving into the medieval world of Diablo. Uh, we have history and lore about the angelic and de demonic beings that wage constant war with one another. Of course, on this plane, why can't they choose somewhere else? We have Tyriel, the renowned champion and former archangel of the high heavens, revealing secrets about the history of Sanctuary and evil threats that yet face humankind. There's a ton of cool stuff, bestiaries, um, different worlds, uh, learning about different magic. We have extra stories in here. So if you love Diablo and the whole franchise, or if you know somebody, this would make an amazing collector gift. This is Diablo, Heradric Vault by a ton of amazing authors. This comes out or came out November 7th. My next book is not quite nonfiction. It's more of a gift book. It's Disney Villains Happily Never After, a villainous book of love and friendship for a very special someone. <laughs> it comes out November 7 from Chronicle Books and Disney Press. And you can tell the person you hate to love and love to hate how you really feel with a charming but cheeky book featuring villainous characters from the darker side of the Disney universe. With thoughtful gifts from poison apples to cuddle puddles, with a trio of hyenas, this mischievous collection of art created by Disney graphic designers is a deviously sweet gift of love and friendship for a very special evil someone. So it could be an anti-Valentine's Day gift or a dark Christmas gift, etc. We can't really see any of the pictures of the inside, but they're full color illustrations of all your favorite zombies. Zombies, excuse me, villains. I'm sure there's some zombies. <laughs> so we just wanted to mention it as a possible Christmas gift. It's Disney villains happily never after. Halloween will never end. Zombies forever. Yay. Uh, so we have next The Exorcist Effect, Horror, Religion, and Demonic Belief. This is by Joseph P. Laycock and Eric Harrelson. And this came out November 7th. This book is a fascinating historical study of the ongoing relationship between horror movies and Western religious culture with a focus on the period from 1968 to now taking its name from the film The Exorcist, which was <laughs> understood to be based on a true story. This book outlines a cycle in which religious beliefs and practices become the basis of films that in turn inspire religious beliefs, practices, and experiences in response. Interesting. So our authors draw heavily from archival research to shed new light on the details of this phenomena, in addition to incorporating interviews with horror authors, film writers, and paranormal investigators. Ooh. So drawing on psychology, sociology, and folklore studies, our authors theorize how film informs religious experience and shapes religious culture. The Exorcist Effect examines the production and reception of things like Rosemary's Baby, obviously The Exorcist, and 
of course, again, The Omen. As seminal films in the genre, figures as Malachi Martin, as well as Ed and Lorraine Warren, who inserted themselves directly into the spotlight, in the horror films that influenced and were inspired by their careers in areas of culture where the influence of the cycle was most apparent, the satanic panic, religious yeah. exorcisms, and moral panic over heavy metal and the messages it was purported to spread. That was such a long-winded, long sentence. Blah, 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 blah. <laughs> so the final chapter, oh, wow, includes or considers the QAnon conspiracy theory and its oh, numerous boy. allusions to film as a contemporary manifestation of the exorcist effect. Interesting how we were including all of that. So it is very deftly researched. It's a very, it's a great book for horror buffs, religious scholars and historians alike. This is published by Oxford university press. So I think this is, pretty solid and it's a very good price point like $29 that's pretty amazing for a study so this is called The Exorcist Effect this is by Joseph P. Laycock and Eric Harrelson my next book is Fallen Angel The Life of Edgar Allan Poe it's by Robert Morgan from LSU Press over 170 years after his death Edgar Allan Poe remains a figure of enduring fascination and speculation for readers, scholars, and devotees of the weird and macabre. In Fallen Angel, acclaimed novelist and poet Robert Morgan offers a new biography of this gifted, complicated author. It focuses on Poe's personal relationships, and Morgan chronicles how several women influenced his life and art. Eliza Poe, his mother, died before he turned three, but she haunted him ever after. The loss of Elmira Royster Shelton, his first and last love, devastated him and inspired much of his poetry. Morgan shows that Poe, known for his gothic and supernatural writing, was also a poet of the natural world who helped invent the detective story, science fiction, analytical criticism, and symbolist aesthetics. Though he died at age 40, Poe left behind works of, excuse me, originality and vision. Fallen Angel explores with depth and feeling. And I have a collection of Edgar Allan Poe biographies, and I am going to add this to it for sure. That's Ooh. Fallen Angel by Robert Morgan. Oh, my goodness. So many Christmas gifts. <laughs> and <laughs> Woo! we have next up the feeling of letting die necroeconomics and Victorian fiction. So this is definitely something I've never even thought of ever so this is by Jennifer McLure, and this came out November 2nd. This book and our author explores how Victorian novels depict the feelings that both fuel and are produced by an economic system that lets some people die in service of the free market. Oh, boy. Holy crap. So this is a very um, heavy book, by the way. And they're very not scholarly. wrong. No. Um, no. No. So uh, McClure argues that Victorian authors present capitalism's death function as a sticking point, a series of contradictions, and a problem to solve as characters grapple with systems that allow, demand, and cause the deaths of their less fortunate fellows. Oh. So uh, she uses the term necroeconomics, positioning uh, Victorian authors even those who were deeply committed to liberal capitalism as hyper aware of capitalism's death function, examining both cano canonical and lesser known works by Elizabeth Gaskell, uh, Harriet Montagu, Charles Dickens, William Morris, uh, George Eliot, lots of people. Um, this book shows capitalism as not straightforwardly imposed via economic policy, but instead as a system functioning through the emotions and desires of the human beings who enact it. Wow. Oh, so this a is a, it's a lot. This is a lot. Um. And it's only 186 pages, but I feel like it would take me a long time to get through this one, for <laughs> me, me <too. laughs> at least. Um, so this is a really fascinating study. This is The Feeling of Letting Die. This is by Jennifer McClure. Woo. I, I know. That one for a while. <laughs> right? <laughs> My next book is The Full Moon Yearbook. 
a year of ritual and healing under the light of the full moon. It's by Julie Peters, and the publisher is surprisingly not Llewellyn. It's David and Charles. What? It's 144 pages. The full moon yearbook combines lore and seasonal lunar wisdom from indigenous, Celtic, and East Asian cultures in a colorful, illustrated celebration of the power of the full moon. There's 13 chapters where we're going to learn the stories, seasonal moods, rituals, tarot cards, and yoga postures that match the energy of each full moon throughout the calendar year. The moon holds its own special magic, and there's been mythology and meaning to the moon in every culture, in every era throughout the world. A common prayer in Irish folklore when one first noticed the moon was, God bless the moon and God bless me, I see the moon and the moon sees me. Aww. Something about the moon makes us feel as if we're in a relationship with it, as if it looks back at us, following our gaze through the car window, even as we zip along the highway. There's comfort in knowing that when a loved one is really far away, even on the other side of the world, we're looking at the same moon. It's full of practical tips and tricks for exploring the power of the moon. That's the Full Moon Yearbook by Julie Peters. I have another weighty uh, book next. It is How to Think About Catastrophe toward a theory of enlightened doomsaying this is studies and violence uh ah. <laughs> yay <laughs> so this is by jean pierre dupoy uh and it came out november 1st during the last century humanity acquired the ability to destroy itself yay for oh, nuclear goody. yeah the direct approach to destruction can be seen in such facts as the ever-present threat of nuclear war, yes, but we have also developed the capacity to do indirect harm by altering conditions necessary for survival, including the looming cloud of climate change. Yep. So how can we look forward and work past the dire position we now find ourselves in to achieve a sustainable future? This book presents a new way of thinking about the future as it examines catastrophe and the human response. It examines different kinds of catastrophe. That includes like natural ones, you know, earthquakes. We have industrial such as Chernobyl and concludes that the traditional distinctions between them are only becoming blurrier by the day. Oh, so boy. this, yeah, Ray, I know. <laughs> I thought this was supposed to be hopeful. So this book aims to build a general theory of catastrophes, a new form of apocalyptic thinking that is grounded in science and philosophy. And ethics for the sake of the future is what is required, which in turn necessitates a new metaphysics of temporality. Oh boy. If a way out of imminent danger is which we find ourselves in to be found, we must first look to radically alter our ethics. Interesting. Um, I would love to read this. This is How to Think About Catastrophe. This is by Jean-Pierre Dupoy. It sounds interesting, but it might be an entire book-long lecture that some of us already don't we already know we don't need to hear it. I know, exactly. <laughs> we're like, we're we we're experiencing it right now. <laughs> My final book is Stark Weather, the untold story of the killing spree that changed America. The publisher is Counterpoint, and the author is Harry N. McLean. It comes out November 28, just in time for your post-Thanksgiving weekend of reading books about killers. Yay. I have never heard of this guy. Charles Stark Weather was considered to be the first mass killer in the modern age of America. In January 1958, he changed the course of crime in the United States when he murdered the parents and sister of his 14-year-old girlfriend, and she possibly was his accomplice, in a house on the edge of Lincoln, Nebraska. They then drove to the nearby town of Bennett, where a farmer was robbed and killed. And then when their car broke down, the teenagers who stopped to help them were murdered and jammed into a storm cellar. By the time the dust settled, 10 innocent people were dead, and the city of Lincoln was in a state of terror. And this is not the natural born killer story, but it sounds similar. It does. Schools closed, men with rifles perched on the roofs of their houses, and the National Guard patrolled the street. Wow. Hmm. So the book covers Starkweather and Fugati's capture and arrest and the resulting trials about the killing spree. Oh, it was the inspiration for natural born killers. Pardon was me. It? Oh. I stand corrected. 
Yeah. And it also inspired Springsteen's iconic album called Nebraska. What? So today wow. the story has dropped far from the natural consciousness. It has new material, new reporting, and new conclusions about the possible guilt or innocence of the girlfriend. Okay. Mm. Very interesting. Wow. That is Starkweather, the untold story of the killing spree that changed America. It is the basis of the film Natural Born Killers, which I now want to rewatch. Comes yeah. out November 28th, and the author's name is Harry N. McLean. And my final book of today. It feels like we're summarizing a year of doom and gloom and things. As we do. <laughs> Not quite December yet, but we're getting there. This is UFO, the inside story of the U.S. government's search for alien life here and out there. This comes out November 14th. It's by Garrett M. Graff. For as long as we've looked to the skies, the question of whether life on Earth is the only life to exist has been at the core of our human experience, driving scientific debate and discovery, shaping spiritual belief and prompting existential thought across borders and generations. And yet, the idea of E.T. has largely been seen as a joke, banished to the realm of fantasy and conspiracy. <laughs> Now, for the first time, the full story of our national obsession with UFOs and the covert decades-long search by scientists, the U.S. military, and the CIA for proof of alien life is told by our author, Garrett M. Graff, who is a Pulitzer Prize finalist, apparently, in a deeply reported and researched history. So this whole thing begins in 1947. No, not ancient aliens. 1947, when two headline-making sightings of strange flying objects uh, near Mount Rainier, Washington. Wow. And this involved a pilot named Kenneth Arnold. And the second, and the second sighting is, uh, was on a ranch in the outskirts of New Mexico called, of course, Roswell. And this was the prompt for the U.S. Air Force's newly formed Department of Defense to create a series of secret programs to determine how unidentified phenomena may pose a threat to national security. Oh boy. So after the next half century, as the atomic age gives way to the space race and the cold war, the search continues bringing together an unexpected group of astronomers, military officials, civilian contactees, and true believers who bring us closer then further, then closer again to answering one of our most enduring questions. What's out there? So we have a lot of cool research, declassified documents, interviews with senior intelligence and military officials, and our author brings to life all of these things in this book. It seems really fun if you are into UFOs. This is definitely up your alley. This is UFO by Garrett M. Graff. And that is our final list of nonfiction books that have come out in November 2023 that are dark, spooky, clearly very weighty <laughs> and, and depressing. But that's what we're here for. If you are looking for some other dark reads, including children's books, YA fiction books as well, comic books, stay tuned every Wednesday and Friday and sometimes Mondays for more episodes. Make sure to tell your friends, family about Dark Side of the Library. We are over on Facebook, Instagram, and of course YouTube and on your favorite listening app as well. Thank you so much for listening. We will see you next time.